Okay, thank you. So uh, yes, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Javi Gomez now uh, with Brown and Barcelona, who's going to speak on uh, symmetry in station and uniformly rotating solutions of fluid equations. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for the introduction, Alex, and thanks a lot for inviting me to <clears throat> all the organizers and for organizing the seminar. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be um, talking about some uh, new work and maybe not so new work, mostly done with uh, uh, my grad student, Jess Shi at uh, Princeton and uh, Yao Yao at Georgia Tech and her grad student, uh, Jamin Park, who is uh, also at Georgia, uh, Georgia Tech. And he is uh, graduating this, um, this spring. So I strongly want to advertise uh, for him. He's, um, he's really, really great. And, uh, and I hope he gets, a, he gets a postdoc at a very nice place. Um, so he's, he's a really good guy. Um, okay, so the main topic or the main body of uh, this talk is to investigate under what conditions um, we have uh, symmetric solutions. And by symmetric solutions, I'm going to mean um, radially symmetric solutions under the ansatz of um, being stationary or being uh, uniformly rotating for certain equations. Okay, so this is the main, uh, the common theme, and I'm going to present uh, some, some results on this. Oops. Okay, so let me start with um, to the Euler. So <clears throat> here, theta is a scalar. Theta is a sort of unconventional notation. Usually, um, one writes omega for, for the vorticity. So there is an incompressible velocity u, uh, which can be written down as a grad pair of a, of a stream function and the relation between scalar theta um, and the stream function is via this, uh, this full Laplace. So one can invert and recover the, the velocity using, using a singular integral operator. And uh, I'm going to denote it uh, as theta just by uh, homogeneity with the notation on the other equations that are going to appear throughout, throughout the talk. Okay, so throughout this talk, I'm going to be referring um, to two different settings. And I will, I will say that I'm in the smooth setting whenever theta is a, is a smooth function. I'm not going to worry too much about what is the precise regularity, but say it's a, it's a smooth function. And I will also talk about the patch setting uh, whenever theta is, um, is a step function, whenever theta is a characteristic function of a set then <laughs> I will say that I am in the, in the patch setting. And this is going to apply to all the, all the equations in this talk. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about uh, patch problems. Um, so the, the point on studying a, a vortex patch or in general a patch problem is that intrinsically this should be an easier problem in some sense, right? Because you reduce all the movement to the boundary of, of this set. Um, and this, this boundary, I'm going to call it uh, Z of alpha T. This Z of alpha T is a parameterization of the boundary between the, between the two phases or between the two sets in which um, the, the scalar takes two different values. And uh, therefore now it, it has moved, the problem has become a 1D problem in terms of say the regularity of the boundary or uh, self-intersection or uh, things like that, okay? So we want to study the behavior of, um, of the body uh, as time evolves. And um, okay, so this is, the, this is the vortex patch equation. The normal velocity is given by this integral operator that has a, that has a logarithmic kernel, okay? So uh, now at this point, uh, after the 90s by the works of uh, Scheman, um, Bertossi Constantine, it is known that if the boundary regularity is C1 alpha, then that, uh, that regularity is preserved globally in time. Okay, uh, but uh, I'm saying this, that these numbers are kind of important in the sense that there was a lot of numerical work in the 70, in the late 70s and in the 80s, uh, trying to investigate this, this problem because people didn't know whether finite time singularities could form. So there is a lot of numerical work and a lot of 
motivation via this um, this singularity question uh, just to uh, just to do research or just to investigate um, solutions that may that may be global uh, in in time. Okay, and this this problem is uh, still open if one considers uh, slightly less uh, regularity, just uh, just see one. Okay, so now let me let me define what I mean by by a stationary solution and more precisely a uniformly rotating solution. So a stationary solution is easy. Um, it is, you know, um, and therefore the only the only term that survives is the is the transport term. And now I'm going to say that um, a solution is uniformly rotating with some angular velocity theta if it is uh, stationary in the rotating frame. Okay, so if I subtract the contribution and it is rotating around the origin, if I subtract the the contribution of the of the rotation, this uh, omega expert, um, then um, then the, the, the patch or the solution itself <coughs> will be um, stationary in, in that frame. So after rewriting a little bit what this uh, uh, what the U is, then we can write this whole thing as a grad pair of some function F. Okay. Uh, and K here is the convolution with the with the Newtonian potential. So now this F, since a uh, grad pair of F um, is orthogonal to grad theta then F is going to be constant in every connected component of the level sets of, of theta, okay? just because of this, of this property. And what is very, very important here is that if, this, um, if there are multiple connected, <coughs> multiple connected components, then this constant may change from component to component. And this is a strong barrier uh, for some of the proofs that uh, were done before ours where they the, the, the multiple connectivity, okay? And this is uh, due, to, due to their technique. So this is a technical abstraction that we are able to overcome just by doing a, like a different type of proof, okay? But it's quite important, the fact that this F is constant, but the constant may be different, okay? And this is in the smooth case. In the patch case, instead of looking at uh, uh, this condition on every level set, then we just look at it on the, on the boundary of, of the patch. Okay, so we would have that F is constant on every connected component of uh, partial D. Okay, so let's see what we can make sense out of, out of this F. And this F is going to appear in the proofs uh, many times. Okay, so the main question is the following. Um, there is this trivial observation that if you start with a radial initial condition or a radial function, then that's a stationary solution. And by our definition, this is also uniformly rotating with any, with any angular velocity. So the, the, the difficult question is, can we say something about the reverse implication? So can we say that if we are uniformly rotating or if we are stationary, then does the solution um, have to be radial? Okay, is the solution forced to be radial in either of the settings uh, under the assumption of, um, uh, stationary or uh, uniformly rotating. And uh, this was done for, for some cases, um, but always or mostly with this um, simple connectivity assumption. So Frankel um, <clears throat> in 2000 proved that in the stationary case, if the patch is um, simply connected, then uh, the only solution is the disk. And uh, MIDI proved in, uh, in another paper in 2014 that if omega is negative and D is convex, um, it's not quite convex, but uh, it's something close to being convex. So I didn't write the, the whole assumption here. Uh, then the only, the only possible solution is the disk. And he also did the case when omega is one half where for which there is, there is a trick using, uh, using harmonic functions. Okay, and the main thing is that all these three proofs use a uh, moving plane. Okay, so um, now the moving plane methods struggle a lot with um, with this um, with this condition of the f being a different constant. Okay. 
And uh, there is a recent paper by Amel and uh, Nadir Asbili where they can prove similar results when D is a punctual domain. So whenever um, <coughs> it is, say, like an annulus or a, or a disk with, uh, with, uh, with a hole. And there are some assumptions in U or some hypotheses in U which are uh, neither contained in ours nor ours are contained in theirs. So these their hypotheses are uh, somewhat disjoint in some sense. I mean, they, they may have overlap, but uh, none of them is contained in the other. In the case when um, omega is C. Okay, um, so these are results on, on the positive side, meaning that there is uh, rigidity. Now there are also flexibility results, uh, and these are like very classical. So by the work of uh, Kirchhoff in the 19th century, then we know that if we start with an ellipse, this is going to be a uniformly rotating solution with some angular velocity depending on the on the parameters of the ellipse. Okay, and this is a, 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 an easy calculation that one can do. You substitute into the velocity and you recover. Okay, so again, let me stress the numerology. Uh, here we have one quarter for the ellipses. And uh, there is this one half here. Okay, um, so this is what uh, what is known about this uh, rigidity flexibility. Um, now, <clears throat> in the 80s or in the late 70s, uh, Deem and, and Tabuski started to investigate these solutions. Keep in mind that at this point, it is not known if the vortex patches have uh, global existence or not. And what they did was they started with a circle and they sort of bifurcated um, along a branch uh, or different branches, and uh, by imposing different degrees of symmetry, then they could uh, they could manage to numerically find uh, the patches like in A and B imposing threefold symmetry, or in C and D imposing fourfold. Okay, so these are numerics, and they just showed that numerically from a disk you can deform it a little and somehow travel through a branch that uh, that gives uh, these solutions. Okay, and uh, not just uh, primary bifurcations, but there are also secondary bifurcations. This is the BC thesis of CAM in 87. And this is a slightly stranger diagram, but this solution corresponds to the disk. This branch are the ellipses. And these two are the ones that I, that I showed before, the threefold uh, branch and the fourfold branch. And what CAM showed was that even in this elliptical branch, there are secondary bifurcations. So he was able to bifurcate at the ellipses at these points, B3, B4, B5. And in fact, there are uh, infinitely many points on, on this branch where you can find non-trivial solutions emanating from the ellipses. Uh, but something important is that this, what he calls omega prime, is actually minus big omega in our notation. And it is contained on the interval zero to one half. Okay, so um, this this is this is an important number. Okay, so so Cam was able to somehow um, compute this compute these solutions. Okay, and more recent numerics are, for example, uh, this picture of uh, um, Hassanini, Masmudi, and Wheeler, where they compute the streamlines of of the function, and you see there are a bunch of uh, stagnation points. Um, and uh, <coughs> and this is sort of how the streamlines of of these uh, of these solutions along this branch uh, look like. Okay. Now at the end of the branch, this is not known, um, but it is conjecture that at the end of the branch, the um, the, the the patch develops uh, some some kind of singularity in the form of a corner, and the corner is conjectured to be of ninety degrees. This is not dynamical, so this is just simply following the branch along the parameters and then the branch ends because the, the patches lose, lose regularity and uh, somehow have these, these corners. Okay, so these are all also numerical results uh, from, from the 80s. Okay, so, but this is still an open problem. And there are other sort of more exotic solutions, um, still numerics, where for example, you can see uh, like a change of topology. If you follow the branch of uh, single vortices, just from, from an ellipse, um, and then you perturb it in, in some way, and you follow that branch, like this one on the left, then you end up getting to a point, which is uh, this one, 
corresponding to this solution where there is some sort of uh, corner singularity as well. Nice thing that you can also go to that point following the uh, two vortices. So if you were able to say to, to traverse the, um, the whole branch, then you would manage to find a continuum of solutions that have uh, a change of topology. So they start at, as, as one vertex and they move around and, and uh, split out. Okay, and again, I stress that this is not dynamic. These are all steady solutions in the rotating frame. So this is just moving um, whichever parameter, uh, whichever parameter you're using to, to follow the branch. Um, okay, but now what can actually one prove? Um, so <coughs> Burbia in 82 um, proved uh, local, uh, local bifurcation at this, um, at these angular velocities. And again, this is a number which is smaller than one half. So, um, and uh, bigger than C. So again, we are still within, within that range. And uh, Midi, Mateo, and Berdera proved that the boundary regularity of these solutions is infinity. And we improved it to, to analytic. And we also showed that uh, one, can, one can construct the secondary bifurcations from, from CAM. And these are all uh, local bifurcation. Um, but uh, there is also global bifurcation by the work of uh, Hassania, Masmudi, and Wheeler. And uh, we were also able to desingularize a patch and sort of produce smooth solutions that are also uh, uniformly rotating. And there, are, have, <clears throat> there have been also um, many works by the group in Spain and in France by uh, Claudia Garcia, Sineb Hassania, Tufik Midi. Francisco de Lao, Juan Mateo, Coral Renault, Juan Soler, and Juan Verdera in, in the late, <clears throat> in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, okay, now what can we actually prove? Uh, we can actually prove the following. Um, so if we take an omega which is smaller or equal than zero on, or greater or equal than one half, and there are no other assumptions on, say, the connectivity, then, then there is nothing. Then the only solutions are the trivial ones. So either disks, or depending on, on the connectivity in nested annular, for example. So this is a, a cartoon of uh, what we can actually prove. So if omega is, uh, is small, then, um, then there is nothing there. And if omega is big, then there is nothing there either. And in between, we have these families of, of non-trivial non solutions accumulating, like the, the angular velocity is accumulating at one half. And the main difference is that uh, our proof is variational as opposed to like all these previous moving plane, uh, moving plane methods. Okay. And uh, using our techniques, there was also uh, another paper to proving similar results when the patches are confined to, to a disk. Okay, so let me outline the proof in the easiest case of all of them, which is the case where we have uh, a patch and the patch is simply connected. And then I will, I will build from there and I will move on to the, uh, to the more general case. Okay, so as I said, the proof is variational. And uh, we're going to start with an energy and we're going to compute the first variation of the energy along a vector field V, which I'm free to pick. And in fact, I will design a V depending on the, depending on the patch um, in such a way that it does that it does the job, and uh, the point is that I can find the v in such a way that the first variation is on one hand zero, and on the other one uh, different from zero. Okay, um, so that's uh, that's, and I'm assuming that I'm not a disk, and that I'm either stationary or uh, uniformly uniformly rotating. So that's uh, that's how the proof is going to work. Now let's see how to pick the right v. Okay, so the first part is to show that i is indeed zero. And for that, we are only going to ask uh, to v that v is uh, divergence free. So for any divergence free uh, v, then um, integrating by parts and using that f is constant on the boundary, then if I integrate by parts and I move the gradient from the f on to v, then I get the divergence of v, that's nice because that's going to go away. And I get the, the boundary term but uh, then the f, I can take it out of the integral and integrate by parts back again. So now I can write i as just an integral involving 
um, a factor of divergence of E, which I am going to pose to be to be zero. So this is this is easy. And now uh, let's produce a V, and I'm assuming very little here about V, just that V is incompressible. So let's produce now a V that makes I to be non-zero. Okay, and this is the this is the difficult part. So what's the intuition is if I have something like this, then I would like to find a V that makes um, that makes my patch more radial, so that it points more towards the center whenever um, the patch is further from the origin. So that would be the, the ideal V. So V, ideally, I would like it to be minus X. But, um, but of course, minus X is not incompressible. So I cannot pick minus X as my V, but um, I can project minus X onto the divergence free vector fields. And this is actually uh, what we do. So we take uh, phi to be, this is the part coming from the minus X part, and then some correction, some correction that I'm going to call P, <coughs> and I'm going to take um, V to be minus the gradient of, of phi. So now by choosing uh, P to have Laplace and equal to minus two, then uh, phi is harmonic, and therefore V is going to be divergence free. So this is, this is actually like another way of, of writing down the projection of minus X onto um, the space of uh, divergence free vector field. Okay, so this is the actual V that, um, that, I'm, that I'm going to choose. And let's see how I looks like for this particular choice of V. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's substitute into I. And we have two terms. This is the term coming from the uh, minus x. And this is the other term coming from p. Um, so let's compute the first one. And the first one is, uh, is an explicit calculation. So the rotation term is not going to change. I substitute for what is f. And uh, if I differentiate this, uh, this term coming from the Newtonian, um, Newtonian kernel and symmetrize, then uh, the whole fraction vanish, I mean, cancels out. So we have x dot x minus y. If I swap variables x and y, then I get a minus y, and uh, all this all this disappears, and uh, we get a contribution coming just in terms of in terms of the area of of d. Okay. So the contribution of the first term is simply um, the area square minus the second moment of of the patch. Now let's see uh, what is the contribution from uh, the p term, uh, which involves like this. This function that we don't really know uh, so so explicit. So what I'm going to do again here is integrate by parts and move one derivative from p um, onto f. And this is why this is because there is this convolution with the Newtonian kernel. So if I take a Laplace in here, then the two um, cancel out, and uh, the rotation term is is explicit. So by moving one derivative from p onto f. Uh, then I get the Laplacian of f, but the Laplacian of f, f is, easy, is easy to compute. And this, uh, this just gives uh, a term involving the integral of p times some number that, uh, that depends on omega. And you can see here, uh, this is very suspicious of uh, omega equal to one half being, being relevant. So if we add everything together, then, uh, then what we get is uh, this for i. And let's do first the case where omega is zero. So if omega is zero, this is gone, this is gone. So we need to compute or we need to compare the integral of p, which one quarter uh, the area of d squared. And, uh, <coughs> and this is already a result by Talenti, um, where for this p, he proves exactly this bound using um, a radial rearrangement uh, techniques. So, so by using this lemma by, by Talenti, we automatically get that, um, that I is different, is different than zero unless I is a disk. Okay? So this is sort of settling the case of, um, of, the stationary, of the stationary patch. Again, in the easy setting uh, where, where the patch is simply connected. Now, if omega is not zero, then we use that the second moment of, um, 
of a patch is minimized by the second moment of a ball with the same with the same area. And that second moment, we can calculate it explicitly in terms of um, in terms of the area. So now using this bound and substituting into the um, into the expression of i, then one gets the good sign actually. Uh, both in the case when omega is uh, negative or above one half. So one can factor uh, everything as this term, uh, the Talenti term, and then another factor that may have uh, one sign or another depending on omega, but it always has the good sign, meaning that the contribution from the second moment will also flip signs depending on, uh, depending on whether omega is positive or negative, but nonetheless, uh, everything will, will put us in the, in the right combination. So now again, using Talenti's lemma, um, then we can prove that I is either negative in the case of um, omega being above one half or positive uh, when omega is, is below zero. Okay, so this is how the proof finishes in, uh, in this setting. And now how to go from the simply connected case to the multiply connected. First, let's still keep uh, being at the patch. So if we have a patch which is uh, multiply connected, then we have the problem that F uh, may take different values on, on every piece. And uh, what we do is, uh, well, we, we pick the same B as before, but we modify the P. So we modify the P in such a way that we can deal with F having this, uh, these different values at, uh, at, every, at every boundary piece. And we uh, reprove or we extend Talenti's lemma to, to this case. And uh, the, the proof goes, goes the same way. Okay, so this is the, how to deal with the multiply connected case. Now, how about the smooth case? So in the smooth case, the main idea is to say, well, if we have some kind of a smooth profile, then what we do is we approximate it by a series of patch domains. So we fix a number n and we consider sort of a, 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 an approximation by these uh, step, function, <clears throat> step functions as functions of n and then derive quantitative estimates for this problem as a function of n. And uh, once we have these quantitative estimates, then we send them to infinity and we recover, um, we recover the, 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 the result for the, for the smooth case. Okay, so this is how uh, we deal with, with the smooth case and the multiply connected case. Okay, so, so these are new results and um, they are going to appear um, probably this week. And uh, what we can prove is now we can do a similar thing or a similar type of result for the vortex sheet problem. So uh, the vortex sheet is when the vorticity is a, is a direct distribution concentrated on a, on a curve or on a family of curves with, uh, with a given amplitude. So uh, the uh, omega is going to be some, uh, theta is going to be like omega of alpha times the delta distribution concentrated on gamma alpha. Um, so now <laughs> in that case, um, we can prove we can prove something similar, namely that if uh, the vorticity amplitude is positive and uh, and the rotation speed is negative or or non positive, then the only the only possibility for these solutions to exist are whenever the curves are nested circles and the vorticity amplitude is just a constant and the constant may depend from piece to piece, but uh, we no other function of uh, say of the curve of alpha is allowed and um, and this in order to prove this what we have to do is the singularize the vortex sheet and convert it into a very thin patch then prove quantitative estimates there um, depending on the um, depending on the width of the, the singularization and send the, the singularization to zero so that's uh, that's how we that's how we do it and uh, there is also the, the counterpart, like the counterpart of this, of this theorem, namely that uh, if omega is allowed to be positive, then we can find non-trivial rotating solutions 
um, on on a curve which is not a, which is not a circle. Okay, and this is the first family of uh, of solutions which are not supported on a which are supported on a closed curve, and this is accomplished using um, bifurcation theory with uh, some twists. Uh, corresponding to the to the local expansion around the around the bifurcation points. So this is kind of a bifurcation diagram of of this setting, and uh, you see that uh, the main obstruction is that there there are two curves at the bifurcation point. Typically, uh, whenever there is bifurcation, there are like two um, two branches. Here there should be another one, like the trivial one. And then uh, we have to sort of do um, an, an expansion around this point and, um, and understand where this, this zero sets. So uh, some of the assumptions uh, on the like uh, Kranda Pravinovich or implicit function theorems fail and, uh, and we have to work a little and uh, do a to do a more sophisticated lyapunov schmidt reduction, okay? And uh, just to give a, an idea of how these points A, B, C, and D look like, uh, then this is sort of how they look like. So this is A, B, C, and D. And you can see uh, they're not drawn to scale. Um, so for example, the, so the left panels are the vorticity amplitude. And you can see, for example, in the panel corresponding to A, that um, part of the vorticity is going to be zero on some part, especially corresponding to this one and this one. And it's going to be big on, on the other, on the horizontal segments. So this may hint uh, that this, this would go, and uh, this is not the end of the branch. This is just the point where we stop computing, but this goes on. So maybe, there is a change of topology in which uh, this uh, <coughs> simply connected shape uh, develops and, and, and breaks down into two segments, for example, that, that could be a possibility. Um, but uh, this is all conjectural. And uh, you can see, for example, like at the fold, everything, everything is nice, everything is smooth, and there doesn't seem to be any problem but uh, the vorticity um, grows as, as we move around the branch. Okay, so for example, D is just this point here and, uh, and one can continue even further, but we just uh, stop computing there. Okay, so this is, this is um, these are new results. And uh, now let me talk very briefly about uh, the SQG equations. So uh, the SQG equations <laughs> come from geophysics and they were used in oceanography and meteorology in in the 50s and 60s and 70s um, but it wasn't until the 90s where um, they gained more traction or more attention in the mathematical community by the paper of Constantine Maidan Tabak where they showed that there is an analogy between SQG and 3D Euler. And now you see why I decided to, to, to call the vorticity theta is that theta for the SQG equations is a temperature. And it is again uh, driven by an incompressible velocity u, but this time the relation between the scalar and the stream function is this uh, fractional Laplacian. So we don't get a full Laplacian, we just get a, a half Laplacian. So the velocity is more singular than, than in the 2D Euler case. And again, this is a, a comparison between 3D Euler and, uh, and the SQG. So the, 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 the clue or the claim is that if one looks at the vorticity for 3D Euler, and if one looks at this object that grad pair of theta for SQG, then they formally satisfy the same, the same equation. Both are incompressible um, and they are related to the the gradient of the velocity is related to these objects by a singular integral operator of, of the same order. Okay, so the hope is that by understanding SQG better, we can understand 3D Euler more. And if we compare it with 2D Euler, then the problem is that, or I mean, it, it's, it's good and it's bad at the same time, but we know a lot less. So uh, in particular, we don't know whether there is global existence of solutions for, for SQG, uh, this is still an open problem. And if you think about how things were like 30 years ago for the vortex patch, 
uh, we are sort of at the same point uh, just for this uh, more more complicated equation uh, than 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 to the Euler. Okay, um, so we can not just take SQG uh, with um, with a fractional like with a Laplacian of one half, but we can think of um, a more general model with a parameter alpha uh, that interpolates between to the Euler and SQG. So alpha here may range even beyond SQG and go all the way to two. So this is called uh, modified SQG or generalized SQG in, in the literature. And uh, we can also derive uh, an SQG patch problem uh, where instead of the logarithmic kernel, there is uh, just a power law kernel. Uh, so again, going in the direction that uh, more singular so more likely to have singularities, uh, but also more difficult to analyze mathematically. So again, the, the curve is uh, evolved via uh, this velocity or this normal velocity. And uh, for, for, for the patch problem, <coughs> we know very little. Uh, we only know that uh, there is local existence in, in C infinity by the work of uh, Rodrigo and uh, then Gancedo proved local existence in in H3, um, and now there have been more advances by lowering the, the regularity of, um, of the patches. Um, and uh, at the linear level, just to give an idea, if one tries to linearize around the disk or around the flat solution, this is dispersive, so we are not really expecting any sort of asymptotic stability of any level. Uh, just if we are kind of lucky, then, then there is just um, stability, maybe like orbit that stability or, or something like that. Okay, so uh, when, when we started working on this problem, we, we knew about the V-states for Euler and we were wondering, well, um, are there V-states SQG? Um, it would mean that these are like the first non-trivial global solutions for this, for this family, for this SQG or generalized SQG. And uh, the answer is yes, um, star V states can bifurcate from, from a disk that have a C infinity boundary that was uh, later upgraded to, to analytic. And uh, those solutions are global because what they do is they just uh, rotate in time with a given angular velocity depending on, depending on the parameters, depending on alpha and depending on M which uh, signifies the the level of, uh, of symmetry of, of the solution. Um, and that's in the patch case. And in the smooth case, we were also able to, to construct um, rotating solutions, uniformly rotating solutions that, uh, okay, this is a cartoon. The profile is more like this, one somewhere, zero somewhere, smooth in between. And this is actually kind of thin. This is about one in 20 compared to this, which is of size one. Okay, so, so these were other global uh, smooth solutions that we were, that we were able to, to, to construct. And these solutions are uh, CK for, for any K um, bigger, than, bigger, than, bigger than two. Before us, uh, <coughs> Dritzel had, uh, had constructed uh, rotating solutions that were not smooth. And after us, uh, Gravellat and Smets constructed uh, smooth traveling solutions. And there is a recent paper of Ao, Davila, Delpino, Musso, and Wei, where they take K vortex points and they desingularize them. Uh, so they take configurations of vortex points that are rotating or translating, and they, they are able to, to, to perform a desingularization around those, uh, those solutions and be able to construct uh, smooth, uh, either traveling or, or rotating solutions of, of uh, SQG. So the proof for, um, for our result, I'm not going to get too much into it, uh, uses uh, local bifurcation theory combined with uh, computer system estimates that we need to study uh, an eigenvalue problem of an operator which is, which is not self-adjoint. Uh, so that's a, that's a very short summary of uh, how the proof works in in this case um so now let me go back in time and uh 
explaining how I how I got into this problem and in how I got into the first part of the talk. So when I first started working on on the stationary problem, there was this paper by uh, Hassania, Midi, and De La Oz where they were taking omega and uh, they were taking annuli, and they they were able to see that for certain values of the of the ratio, this is b and this is one. And um, they were able to find eigenvalues, and here the eigenvalues are, are the omegas that were rotating clockwise and counterclockwise. So they were in speeds of rotation, um, both one way and the other one. Okay. Uh, and then <coughs> they were wondering uh, that, okay, uh, we are able to find this. These solutions that that can rotate with uh, with positive speed, or, or uh, we can also find solutions that can rotate with negative speed. Can we find solutions that rotate with zero speed? The the point is that if one tries to do the bifurcation at zero, then you can still do it, but then you have no control of how the branch of solutions is going to look like. Like it could go very well like this, and then you haven't proved anything because the the only solution for which the angular velocity is zero is the trivial one. And uh, so this is not feasible like that. And you either study um, like a local bifurcation sort of theorem uh, around this and try to connect the two branches or you do something else. Um, and then uh, I did something else. So I said, well, instead of trying to bifurcate in, in omega and fix B, Let's do it the other way around. Let's fix omega to be zero, and let's see if we are lucky, and we find a radius of this annulus for which we can bifurcate in a non-trivial way. And it turns it turns out that, that that works, and we can by swapping the parameters, then we can we can bifurcate. There are certain aspect ratios of the annulus for which we can find uh, non-trivial non-trivial stationary solutions. And then, well, I thought, okay, I can do this for SQG. Can I do it for Euler? And um, this is sort of what it triggered all the all the first part because for Euler, um, one has to solve an equation like this with b smaller than one, and then uh, one sees that this condition is not is not attainable. So there is some kind of condition um, equivalent to the bifurcation that doesn't work, and then I was thinking, well, is this a technical thing? or does it really happen that there is no solution? And uh, sort of after this, um, uh, explaining the story in a, in, a, in a different way or in a different order, um, then we sort of started working on the direction of seeing whether in the, like let's say in the multiply connected case, there was the possibility of, uh, of having a solution, but it turns out that, that there is not. Okay, so now what can we prove for, for SQG? So for SQG, we do the following. Again, a similar thing. If we take omega to be negative or big, then there are no, there are no solutions under the extra assumption of uh, being simply connected. Uh, we have seen that if uh, we relax the hypothesis of being simply connected, then one can find um, non-trivial solutions by forgetting from annulets. Uh, let's impose that, this, that the patches or that the smooth functions uh, have uh, simply connected super level sets, then there is nothing. And, uh, and this omega alpha is sharp. So we can find an omega alpha such that we can find non-trivial solutions arbitrarily close. And beyond that, either to the left or to the right, uh, the only possibilities are disks. Um, and this is even widely, <clears throat> more widely open um, because the only point where there is work is when um, in the stationary case, where uh, Choksi, Neumeyer, and Topaloglu uh, posted a, a recent paper where they managed to, to prove it um, only for alpha between zero and uh, five thirds. Okay, so, um, but beyond five thirds, that was uh, still open, and moreover, they had to assume a lot of regularity on, on the boundary of the patch. And the way we do it, uh, these are different proofs. So for the <coughs> small omega case, we do a, continu a continuous triangle symmetrization. And uh, for the big omega case, we do a maximum principal argument. This is something that I, that I want to comment on in the three minutes that, uh, that I have left. 
And uh, as I said, this proof extends to the to the smooth case just by looking at the at the super level sets and assuming that the super level sets are simply connected. But uh, the continuous Steiner symmetrization argument also goes through in in the okay. So now let me briefly explain how to do the case when omega is bigger than omega alpha. So the setting is going to be this one. We're going to have a candidate D for um, stationary or rotating parts that we're going to put inside a big ball of radius R. So this is R. And this I'm going to call it U. And this I'm going to call it D. And uh, the furthest point, I will denote it by X naught. So this is which is uh, the furthest and which is at the distance uh, capital R. First, the, the stationary and the uniformly rotating condition um, forces that this f of x stand on the boundary. So now I'm going to consider g of x, which is this function here plus uh, this term here. Uh, the the <coughs> characteristic function of u um, convolved against x to the minus alpha. The point is that this function g is radial. And now if I look at uh, the function uh, one u star x to the minus alpha, then this is equal to g of x minus c on, on the boundary. And I'm going to pick omega uh, large enough such that this function g is increasing. The whole point is that I can find or I can claim that the maximum of g uh, restricted to the body is attained at x naught, but we will see in a minute why. So this is the setup, and now I want to compute uh, the gradient of this term um, at the point x naught um, multiplied by the direction of x naught. So I'm going to do that in two ways. The first one is to do it directly. So if one does directly, uh, differentiates the the singular integral kernel and uh, and evaluates, then um, one gets this negative sign. And this negative sign is coming from the fact that this term and this term all lie on the same half plane. And this is by the choice of x naught because the tangent uh, the tangent plane uh, is going to have all the parts on on one side. So this is how to get a, a sign easily from just by doing a direct computation. And a more indirect calculation is the following. So as I said before, the maximum of, uh, of this function is attained on the boundary, is attained at x naught, uh, because we picked omega to be large enough. Now, that function as well is uh, subharmonic. So we can apply a maximum principle. And then the maximum principle tells us that the maximum is attained at, uh, at x naught, because we are also using this condition here that on the boundary, the maximum is attained at x naught. But now we can use Hopf's lemma. And by lemma, we essentially get the other, um, the other sign. So this gives a contradiction. And the contradiction is coming from uh, assuming that, uh, that D is not a disk. So this is how, how we prove that, uh, that actually omega, uh, if omega is big enough, then this, this cannot happen. And if one optimizes, the, the, the omega uh, with, uh, with all the constants appearing in the integral kernel and so on in, in G, then what actu one actually gets the, the optimal omega. So this is what I wanted to say. Thank you all for, for coming and thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you, Javi. Thank you for a very nice talk. Wonderful. Uh, are there any questions? Any questions from anybody? Okay.